Welcome to our second presentation for Chapter 6. <laughs> In our previous presentation on the electronic structure of atoms, I taught you guys how to devise an element's electron configuration. Now you may notice that an electron configuration can be pretty long for elements that are further down on the periodic table. For example, the electron configuration of bromine, element number 35, is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p5. Whew. I doubt that most of you guys want to write something that long out. I know that I don't. So what in the world can we do? Well, instead of writing the longhand electron configuration for an element, there's a shorthand or condensed way of doing it. Using this condensed approach, we just write in brackets the symbol for the noble gas that comes before the element on the periodic table. Then we write the rest of the electron configuration between that noble gas and the element in question. For example, if we wanted to, we could write out the longhand electron configuration of phosphorus as being 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p3. Or we could just notice that the noble gas that precedes phosphorus on the periodic table is neon. We could then write the shorthand electron configuration of phosphorus by describing all the electrons between neon and phosphorus. This would be done as follows. We write neon in brackets, and then we just write the electron configuration between neon and phosphorus, which is 3s2, 3p3. This is called a shorthand or condensed electron configuration. So let's do a problem. Question number nine from problem set six. I want you to write the condensed electron configurations for the following atoms using the appropriate noble gas core abbreviations. For problem set six, question nine, we are asked to write a condensed electron configuration for the atoms listed. Now I'm going to not do all of those. I'll just pick one at random. I'll pick selenium, letter E. If we look at the periodic table, we can see that selenium is element number 34. So this is element 34. If I were to write the entire electron configuration for selenium, it would take me a while. However, I am going to write the abbreviated electron configuration for selenium. What I do is I realize that the noble gas that precedes selenium on the periodic table is argon, element number, number 18. So I write argon with brackets around it, and when we see this, that denotes the entire electron configuration for argon. Now all I do is I add electron configurations uh, for everything in between argon and selenium. So after argon, element number 18, we go to element number 19, potassium, which is on row 4s in the s block. I count up. Potassium is in 19, calcium is in 20, 4s2. Now I move into the d block with element 21. Now you might remember me telling you that d orbitals on the same row in the periodic table are actually one energy level lower than the s orbitals and p orbitals in the same row. So in other words, on row 4, potassium and calcium correspond to 4s orbitals. But as soon as I get to element number 21, scandium, I am in the 3d level. And now I count up. Elements 21, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 30. All take me through the entire D block in that row with 10 electrons in it. I'm now at element 31. Element 31 is gallium, which is the first element in the 4P row. I now count up 31, 2, 3, and 4. I'm finally at element 34, selenium. which has four electrons in the 4p row. 
So this is the condensed or abbreviated electron configuration for selenium. Let's see if we can pick a different element. We'll pick lead. So letter C is lead. If I look at the periodic table, lead, lead is element number 82. Once again, if I were to write the entire configura electron configuration for lead, it would be very long. But I don't have to. I'm going to look and find the element that precedes lead in the noble gas column. The noble gas that precedes lead on the periodic table is xenon, element number 54. So I write xenon in brackets. And now all I need to do is write the remaining electron configuration between xenon and lead. So the next element after xenon is element 55, cesium. Cesium is in row 6, so it has a 6s. If I count up cesium 55, barium 56, that, is, that corresponds to two electrons, so 6s2. Now one thing that can be confusing is I'm remembering that the next element in the periodic table after barium is not element 71. It's actually element 57, which is down here in the F block, which is frequently and typically shown underneath the periodic table here, or underneath the D block in the periodic table. So these are the lanthanides. So I go 55, 56, and now I get to the F block. Well, the first element in the F block is actually a 4F. This is really kind of confusing, but if you look at the uh, periodic table that I showed you earlier in our uh, PowerPoint presentation, you'll see that the first row of Fs actually starts at energy level 4. That indicates that F orbitals are closer to the nucleus than the S orbitals are in the same row. So I start counting up my Fs. I count them all up, and I will end up seeing, as I go from element 57 all the way to 70, that I indeed have 14 electrons. Once we hit 70, we now go to element 71. Element 71 is in the D block, and it is 5D. I start counting across from element 71 all the way to 80, and I've gotten now... 10 electrons. I'm now going to the next element, 81, which is in the 6p row. And I count until I get to lead, which is two slots in. So this is the abbreviated or condensed electron configuration for lead. I'll let you guys work on the remaining problems from that question. Now at this stage, you may be asking yourself, so now that I know how to assign an element its electron configuration, what in the world does that tell me? Rest easy, my dear student, for I'm about to tell you the answer. Do you remember me teaching you earlier in our previous presentation about quantum numbers and orbitals? Well, this stuff all goes hand in hand. You see, for every part of an element's electron configuration, this number represents the principal quantum number, or energy level, n. This letter represents the shape of the orbital in question, in this case, an s orbital. And this number represents how many electrons, in this case two, are occupying the orbital in question. So let's return to oxygen, which has an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Here's oxygen's tiny nucleus where its neutrons and protons are kept. Around the nucleus is a spherically shaped 1s orbital. It contains two electrons. Outside of the 1s orbital is a larger, also spherically shaped, 2s orbital, which also contains two electrons. Outside of the 2s orbital are three dumbbell-shaped 2p orbitals oriented along the x, y, and z axes. Now you'll notice that the last part of oxygen's electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, says 2p4. 
This means that there are four electrons occupying oxygen's three 2p orbitals. So where do these electrons go? Well, they fill up these orbitals one at a time. In other words, electrons won't pair up to occupy the same orbital until there's no other option left. This is called Hund's rule, although it's worded in your book in a really baffling manner. <laughs> So this means that the four electrons occupying each 2p orbital fill up like this. The first one goes here, the second one goes here, and the third one goes here. Now keep in mind that each of these dumbbells is one 2p orbital. And there are three total 2p orbitals, one along the x-axis, one along the y-axis, and one along the z-axis. So thus far, I've had three electrons be able to each occupy an orbital and not be paired. Oxygen has a fourth electron, however, and there is not a fourth 2p orbital. It's not going to go into a higher energy orbital like a 3s orbital because that would be less stable than pairing. So where does that fourth electron go? Well, it ends up having to go in to one of the same orbitals as the other. So these two electrons, one here and one here, are indeed paired and are both occupying this orbital, this 2p orbital that is found straddling the x-axis. Now you should remember that the two paired electrons in the 2p orbital along the x-axis are different from each other because one of these has a plus one-half spin and the other has a minus one-half spin. So when we talk about oxygen having an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, this is what we're talking about. We're saying that in oxygen's 1s orbital, there are two paired electrons. In its 2s orbital, there are two more paired electrons. And in its three 2p orbitals, there are four electrons, one, two, three, and four, two of which, these two along this x-axis 2p orbital, are pa uh, paired. And the other two, one in the y-axis and the other on the x-axis, are unpaired. Now this cool slash lame table from your book shows us an alternate way of portraying several elements electron configurations. You'll notice that the up arrow denotes a plus one half spin and the down arrow denotes a negative one half spin for electrons that are paired within the same orbital. So if we look here at lithium for example, its electron configuration is 1s2, 2s1. This means that in its 1s spherical orbital it has two paired electrons and they go one having a positive one-half spin and the other having a negative one-half spin. It's one electron occupying the 2s orbital fills in here completely unpaired. We can follow an analogous pattern as we move forward showing these uh, similar diagrams for these other elements on the periodic table. So let's do a problem. Question number 10 from problem set 6. I want you to identify the specific element that corresponds to each of the following electron configurations and then indicate the number of unpaired electrons that it has. Now, as I've done in the past, you guys are welcome to pause the video right now if you wish and attempt to do these problems on your own before you tune into my answers that are forthcoming. I should warn you, as I have in the past, that I won't give you the answer to every single question, but just a few of them to get you started and allow you to do the rest on your own. Let's begin with uh, letter B. So letter B, we're given the electron configuration 1s2, 2s2, and 2p4. As we look at the periodic table and try and figure out where that is, we'll notice that 1s2 takes us from hydrogen to helium, and then 2s2 goes through lithium and beryllium, and 2p4 takes us four elements in to element number eight, which is oxygen. A really easy way to do this is to remember that these superscripts represent electrons. So if I add those up, two plus two plus four equals eight, that is the uh, number corresponding to the element on the periodic table. So this is atomic 
number eight, which is the atomic number of oxygen. So that answers the first part of the question. The next part of the question is asking how many unpaired electrons does it have? Well, you should remember that these electrons fill up their orbitals from the innermost orbital to the outermost orbitals in order. So this 1s orbital, which is a sphere, has two electrons in it, which are both paired. There's a 2s orbital, which is larger and also spherical outside of the 1s orbital, and these two electrons are also paired inside that orbital. 2p orbitals represent three dumbbell-shaped orbitals on the x, y, and z axes like this, and I have four of them. Those electrons will go into each orbital unpaired until they have to pair. One electron goes into one orbital, second electron goes into a second orbital, a third electron goes into the third orbital, and the fourth electron is required to go into that same third orbital because there's not a fourth p orbital to go into. So the question asks us, how many unpaired electrons are there? Well, there's one unpaired electron here and here. So the answer is two unpaired electrons. Now we'll do problem set six, question number 10, part D. I'm not sure why I picked that one, just because I thought it would be fun. So the electron configuration that we're given is krypton, 5s2, 4d10, 5p4. What element does that correspond to? Well, I'm going to look at the periodic table, find krypton, and then continue on down the line. 5s2 takes me from rubidium to strontium. 4d10 takes me all the way across that row of d's. 5p4 takes me 1, 2, 3, 4 uh, elements into element number 52. So that takes me to element 52 from the periodic table, which is tellurium. So that answers the first portion of that question. The second portion of the question is to figure out how many unpaired electrons are there. One way you can do this, once again, is to just look at the orbitals. A 5s orbital is going to be spherical in shape. It's going to be much larger than the lower s orbitals, of course. It contains two electrons, which are both paired. The 4d block has 10 electrons in it, and that is an even number, and all of those are going to be paired. Two electrons in each of the five 4d orbitals. Now we'll get to the 5p orbitals, and I'm going to kind of refrain from drawing the 4d orbitals just because they're really a little bit crazy. The 5p orbitals are, of course, going to be dumbbell in shape, one along each of the axes, z, y, and x. I've got four electrons, and they fill up unpaired, one, two, three, until we get to the point where we have to pair one. So the other electron is going to pair into this orbital. These two electrons are paired. These electrons right here are unpaired. So the answer is two.